The thing is, um, I would start um, mentioning these random sponsors. Next thing you know, I'd start getting phone calls or cease and desist letters or something. So we won't we won't make it as a joke, you know. But you got to have fun with, with the uh, with the job whenever you can. When people ask me what my job is like, I say I teach for free. They pay me to go to meetings. All right. Okay. Let's get started. Lecture eight. Um, how did the first trust homework go? I'm hoping it was boring. Mm -hmm. Then you kind of get what's going on. Um, and that's kind of what I'm interested in. Um, to be honest, uh, I'm not really interested in doing... Um, trust analysis for the sake of trust analysis. So we do have two more lectures on the method of joints, but each of these lectures has a specific purpose, okay? Because I, I don't really have much else to teach you from the, like, the overall theory and science standpoint, but I, I, I would say that my next two lectures are more about practical applications. So um, today, um, so first off, I, I guess I'm, I'm uh, uh, my, my, my last statement was false a little bit because I want to talk about stability and determinacy uh, of trusses. Um, I had mentioned that a while back, and so I do want to take a slight detour there. Our example today on the method of joints is really focused on two aspects of truss analysis. The first is whenever you have members that are at different slope ratios, your homework assignment and the problem that we did in class, all of the diagonals were all at the same slope ratio. This one's not the case, okay? They're gonna be at different slope ratios. Does that make the problem any more or less difficult? No, it's the same idea. It's just more bookkeeping and requires you to be a tad more diligent on your note-taking uh, uh, side of things, okay? So that's, uh, that's the first thing I wanna uh, um, uh, deal with uh, in this example. The second thing I wanna deal with is symmetry, okay? Um, the example that we did in class and your homework, uh, those were not symmetric structures. Now your homework was probably a tad more realistic because it was sort of like an awning or a, a canopy type truss. Um, but the one that we did in class was, was not symmetric. And if I'm going to be honest with you, our example in class was very um, not realistic. In other words, it was good from a learning perspective, but we really don't deal with trusses like that in the real world very often. Oftentimes, in, in the real world, we will deal with trusses that have both symmetric geometry and symmetric loading, okay? And so the point is, you only have to solve half of it, okay? You only have to solve half the truss, and then the rest of the results are mirrored, right? That's more representative of real world. So we're, we're approaching a little bit more real world stuff today. Uh, our class on Monday is um, going to be just looking at uh, two other aspects of trust analysis, being able to identify zero force members, and being able to, um, to solve two equations, two unknowns for certain joint analyses. Okay, um, there, I'm sorry, did everybody get the code? Okay, all right. Um, let's talk about stability and determinacy first, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, when we are analyzing trusses, we make the following assumptions. We assume that all the members are, are um, connected with frictionless joints. We have all the loads, all the support reactions applied at the joints, and then uh, at each of the joints the, where the members connect, the centroidal axes or the neutral axes of all those members all coincide at the, the joint location. So uh, what that means is that the truss members are only carrying axial load. And we have two um, methods that we can utilize, the method of joints and the method of sections. We haven't yet covered the method of sections in here, we'll do that later. Um, but today, uh, we're still looking at the method of joints. The big thing with the method of joints is that you're limited to two unknowns, okay? So for example, if I'm looking at this truss and I've got a bunch of loads on it and I solve the reactions, I can't immediately start my analysis with joint B. There's too many unknown forces going through joint B. That doesn't mean I can't solve joint B at some point, I just can't do it right now. I'd have to start like joint F or joint L and then take those results and maybe go to joint G or joint A or, or what have you. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I would like to do is I would like to talk about internal indeterminacy, okay? Um, we haven't talked about this yet, but we have talked about external indeterminacy, okay? I'm gonna jog your memories a little bit. Y'all remember this, okay? 
Remember that we can take a structure and classify its degree of external indeterminacy. And what we're doing when we classify external indeterminacy is we're comparing the number of unknowns to the number of knowns. I mean, that formula, that, that yellow formula there on the slide is really just the number of unknowns that we're considering minus the number of knowns, right? And if we get a negative value for I, that means the structure is unstable. If we get a non-negative value, that means it should be stable. It's either determinate or indeterminate, um, depending upon the value of I. And when we say should be, what we're saying is, you know, the reactions can't all be concurrent and they can't all be parallel. If the reactions are all parallel, we kind of have like a skateboard. And so if we apply a load this, uh, you know, uh, that's not in the direction of those uh, reactions, the structure will just translate. Uh, and if the reactions are all concurrent, the structure will just rotate. If we ever um, place a, uh, um, if we ever place a load that causes a rotation. Okay. Does this make sense? Y'all remember this? We good. Okay. I want to talk about this truss. Okay. I want to just sort of make a point about this particular structure. Okay. So let's take a look at this. I have a truss that has what, ten joints, like five on the top, five on the bottom, right? and I have a hinge and roller connection. Now let's say I take this truss and I put a bunch of loads on it, okay? Um, would you have any problem computing the support reactions? Support reactions should be pretty easy. We have one, two support reactions over here, one support reaction over there. We can just apply equations of equilibrium, no problem, okay? So how would you start the method of joints analysis? Let, let's start doing this. Let's just label these. So can we start analyzing joint A? Why? There's three unknowns. There's three unknowns. What about joint E? What about F or J? Tell you what, can we analyze any of the joints in the structure? No. That's a problem, right? Is there anything physically preventing us from building a structure like this? No. I mean, get me some, you know, lumber and some gusset plates, I'll, I'll build you a truss like that. But um, can we solve it? No. Um, at least not yet. Can we solve it? Yes. The answer is just not yet. The problem is that we run into a problem with the method of joints because with the method of joints, this structure contains joints where all the joints have gr uh, greater than or equal to three unknowns. Okay, um, but we only have two equations of, uh, of equilibrium at each joint. So I propose that this structure is internally indeterminate. Okay, it's not externally indeterminate, it's internally indeterminate. We can solve for the reactions, no problem, but that's it. After that, it, it kind of becomes impossible to solve with our current tool set. Will we be able to solve it later? You bet, uh, but we're going to have to learn a little bit more about structural behavior before we start approaching a problem like this, okay? Um, the reason why is that if we compare the number of unknowns versus the number of knowns, we have to look at the problem a little bit differently if we're looking internally. For unknowns, I propose that there is one unknown for every member in the truss because every member in the truss has an unknown axial force, either a tension or compression or, or what have you, right? So there's one unknown for every member. There's also one unknown for every support reaction because from a method of joints perspective, they are unknowns because their loads apply directly to the joints, okay? So my unknowns is, I guess I'll say M plus R, the number of members in the truss and the number of support reactions. So M plus R would be the number of um, uh, unknowns. What about the number of knowns? Okay, what quantities do I know about the structure? Okay, well I propose for this structure, there are, what, 10 joints? I propose that for those 10 joints, we have two known quantities for each joint. So number, so 20 knowns. And what do I know about each joint? Well, at each joint, equilibrium must be tamed. So at each joint, the sum of forces in the x direction must be zero, and the sum of forces in the y direction must be zero. So if there's 10 joints, two equations of, unknown, uh, of equilibrium at each joint, I have 20 known quantities. So what I can now do is, I, if remember we had an I sub E, now I can calculate an I sub T. 
I can calculate a degree of internal indeterminacy. And what am I doing? I am comparing the number of unknowns to the number, oh, sorry. I'm comparing the number of unknowns to the number of knowns. That's what I'm doing, the unknowns minus the knowns. So the equation is in the same format as it was before, same format, okay? Um, what am I getting, or what am I pl plugging in? I'm plugging in the total number of members, I'm plugging in the total number of unknown support reactions, and the total number of joints. So M plus R minus 2J. Why is it 2J? Because for every joint there are two equations of equilibrium. Some of the forces in the X direction equal zero, some of the forces in the Y direction equal zero. Now, the same kind of idea applies here, that if you get a negative value for I, the truss is internally unstable. But if you get a non-negative value of I, either a zero value for I or a positive value for I, I say the truss should be stable, either should be determinate or should be indeterminate. Same idea applies. Now the whole note on should be, uh, there's two things to keep in mind. The first thing is that a truss cannot be um, internally stable if it is not externally stable. Okay. So I don't really care what's going on with, with IT or anything like that, but if the truss is externally unstable, none of this matters. So, so it's, it's unstable, period. Um, but for the truss to, but past that, um, for the truss to be categorized as stable, um, the specific definition is that the truss must be constrained against rigid body movements. That is a mouthful. That is kind of, I guess, maybe difficult to wrap your head around because there's not really a hard and fast formula. But the easiest way to interpret that is that if I were to look at a truss like this, this truss would be internally unstable, okay? Because notice how there's no central member right here. So that means if you were to apply a horizontal load, it would just sort of topple over, okay? And a good way that you can tell whether or not a truss is internally unstable is if there's a region without triangles. So if you notice, like in our next example, every single sort of like open bay space of the truss has a triangle, you know, component to it. Because triangles are sort of where the truss achieves its stability. So if you ever have a truss that looks something like that, it's, it's unstable, okay? Does that make sense? And, and I'll tell you this, um, on either a homework or an exam, this is not an area where I'm trying to trick you uh, because to be honest, we're not really in the business in the world of structural engineering of building very many unstable trusses. You know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? Everybody good? Okay. So we're gonna do this truss. Um, let me pull this up on the notebook here because uh, I want to make a couple of points about this truss. Okay, so here's our truss that we're going to analyze. The first thing I want to point out is that this truss is both externally stable and determinate as well as internally stable and determinate. This is a very straightforward calculation, so I just went ahead and did it for you. Um, if you look at this truss, there are a total of three support reactions here, here, and here. Um, there are a total of 12 joints, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, that's 12 joints, okay? And for the number of members, there are 21 members, okay? And so the way that I'm gonna do that, this truss is symmetrical, so I've got this member here in the middle, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, times two is 20, and then the one in the middle is 21, okay? So there are 21 members, three reactions, 12 joints. So M plus R minus 2J, plug and chug, you'll get an IT value of zero, okay? Does that make sense? All right. Um, the other, okay, so everybody good on the internal indeterminacy? Because I don't have any real direct examples on that, but I do have a couple homework problems where I'm giving you some trusses and saying, okay, uh, do me a favor and tell me what the classification is. But again, I'm not trying to trick you. It's, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Everybody good on that? Okay, all right. Now, the other thing I want to point out is 
symmetry. Okay, this truss is 72 feet long, and I have sort of six bays that are 12 feet apart. So if you first off, if you ever see this type of notation right here where it says six at 12 equals 72, what that means is that there's one, two, three, four, five, six spaces, and they're each 12 foot long. So six times 12 is 72. I have five vertical loads that are six kips, and notice how they're all placed symmetrically. Okay, so the reactions are actually really easy to figure out. I've got six times five, I've got 30 kips down, 30 kips up means that's 15 and that's 15. No horizontal loads means that's zero. You can write an equation of equilibrium if you'd like, uh, but that's what you're gonna get. Um, the cool thing about this is that I only have to solve up through this end and then I'm done, okay? Now, um, one of the things I'm gonna tell you before we move on to this, uh, to the actual analysis is, um, there's something I can point out without doing any math. And I'm going to point this out right now. This member, DJ, is a zero force member. Okay? In other words, it does not have a tensile force. It does not have a compressive force. The force inside that member is zero. Okay? Now, some of you are like, how did you figure that out? We're going to talk about that on Monday. Okay? how I was able to just look at the truss and tell you that it's zero. Okay? And there's actually a very easy way of doing it, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that on, uh, on Monday. But we will do that. But I'll go ahead and tell you that's a zero force member. Okay. Um, before we get into the analysis, a couple things I'm going to go ahead and do. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting slope ratios on all these members. So, like, for example... This member over here, this diagonal, I go over 12 feet, how far do I go up? I go over 12 and up 6, okay? So this diagonal member right here is at a 1 to 2 slope ratio. Does everybody see that? Okay, and the same thing is going to be true for this member, this member, this member, this member, and this member. They're all at the same slope ratio, okay? What about this one? What's this one going to be at? One to one. That's going to be at a one to one slope ratio. What about this one? Three to two. Okay. Does everybody see that? And again, the same thing is true on the mirror images. So this is at a three to two. This is at a three to one. Or sorry, one to one. One to one. Okay. Okay, so far so good? All right, now before we move on to the actual analysis, I want to do something I didn't do last time. And I think it's easier to talk about this before, I think it's easier to talk about this once we already have a trust analysis done and we've sort of shaken the rust off. Let's sort of think if we can develop a strategy, okay? For example, Let's, let's assume we're starting at the left and working our way this way. Which joint would you like to solve first? A. a. Okay. So we're going to solve joint A first. Okay. What members, once we get done with that solution, what trust members are we going to know after joint A? A, B, and H. Okay. So let's highlight those. So this is A, B, and A, H. Okay. So somebody help me out. Um, if what's the next one we should do? H. H. Okay, and A H is going to give me which two members? Okay. So now what? Now what do I do? B. And B is going to give you B I. There you go. B C. Now which one? See what I'm doing? So what I'm doing here at the very beginning, and this is particularly valuable maybe on an exam, is, you know, look, it's an exam. It's a timed experience. Um, what I don't want to do is just, just start doing stuff. You know what I mean? Let's take a second. Plan out what we're going to do. What answers are going to give me uh, what values? So, for example, when I solve joint I, 
That's going to give me this and this. Then what do I do? Joint C. Joint C is going to give me this member and this member. And then what joint? D. Now here's the thing about joint D. Joint D, I'm only going to have one member to solve. Now why is that? Now that might, might seem a little weird, like, well, hold on, Dr. Mike. If I look at joint D, I've got this member and this one. Why am I saying there's only one member to solve? Because it's, it's symmetrical. So whatever I get for CD is going to be this answer, right? Keep in mind, this is a symmetric structure. And it's got to be symmetric with, with respect to both loading and geometry for this to work. Like if I were to take this six kip load at K and just make it go away, I'd have to solve the whole truss, okay? I'd have to do the whole thing. Uh, but because everything's symmetric, I don't have to worry about that. See, when I've solved joint A and I get these two members, I get these two members as well, right? So when I solve joint H and I get this one and this one, I get this one and this one for free, right? I have to consider that. So when I get to this joint, this is kind of my last joint because there, I'll know everything from the other side. Does that make sense? Okay, so now that we've sort of talked a lot of stuff out, let's see if we can go through this truss analysis maybe a little faster. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I, I did go through that a bit. Let's see, but let's see if we can go through this trust analysis maybe a bit more expeditiously than we did last time. And again, I, I tend to believe that if you're finding this experience not really boring, but sort of like mundane, I mean, you're, you sort of know what you're doing, and you're then good, then you learn something. Yeah. Okay. Does everybody have this worked out? Okay, so let's see what we can knock out. Okay. Okay. So again, same process as before. Draw the joint. Draw the members. What's this slope ratio? There we go. Any loads going through the joint that we know? A Y. Okay. What about unknowns? If I just look at X and Y components, I've got an X and Y right here. <coughs> Bless you. I've got an X and Y right there and then that right there. So let's see if we can knock this out kind of quickly. Um, so help me out. Um, what's, tell me what to do. What do I do first? Some forces in the Y. And what does that tell me? So this is 15 going down, right? And so we'll call this 15 kips going down, right? All right. Maybe if you want, I will. All right. So tell me what to do now. Um, if I know this one, then what? The slope ratio will give me AHX. AHX, not Y. So, can somebody tell me which direction AHX is facing? Left. Left. I'm curious, can anybody eyeball this and tell me how much AHX is? 30. 30. then some of the forces in the X direction is going to give me what? There you go. So would you agree that that joint's kind of done? I mean, it really is, right? 
So here's something I'm going to do, and don't get me wrong, don't worry, I'm going to put this on the, uh, the notebook uh, at the end, but watch this. I'm going to keep myself a nice little record right here on the board. Okay, so... One little trick whenever you're doing a trust analysis, maybe have a separate little diagram of the truss so that as you're doing the truss, you can track your answers. So what I'm getting at is, would you agree that this member is, what is this member, 30 kips in tension? What is this member, by the way? Say it again. 33.54. In what? Compression. Compression. So we'll say A, B, C, D. We'll just sort of like do that, just to indicate symmetric about center line. And then this is H, I, J. And actually, let's let's be specific. Let's put that on there too. Let's just have it on hand. Okay. With me so far? Because ultimately, I mean, all the Pythagorean theorems could be done at the end. We don't have to do them right now. I mean, you could, you know. Okay. So far, so good? All right. So what's the next joint? H. We said, let's, let's actually, since let's sort of re reduce the scrolling. We said A, H, B, I, C, and then D. That was the order. And so we did that one. Okay, so let's see what we get. So now we have a little image there on the board to sort of reference. Okay, so joint H. Looks like that, right? Okay, what are the slope ratios of these members? What's that? One to two. Are there any external loads? There's a six kip load. Any forces that I know? AH. So I know this one and this one. And I know that this is 30 kips, 15 kips, right? Okay. Which direction does the 30 kips go? And this, because it's compression. Okay, so what's left? This member, this member, this member. Okay, so tell me what to do. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, we could do it later. That's what I'm saying. I mean, we're not using it for this joint analysis. We, so I guess my point is you could do it now or you could do it later. It wouldn't really matter. But you would have to resolve it in the X and Y anyways. Yeah. yeah you wouldn't go back to it. Exactly, okay. yeah. Like, what what I don't want to do is find the magnitude and then take that magnitude and split it up into X yeah. Y again. There's no point. Yeah. Okay. But the other thing I'm doing is I put a little diagram here on the side and went ahead and wrote it down. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no problem. Okay, so tell me what to do. Tell me how I should approach this joint analysis. And what's that going to give me? And so that's going to be HIX going to the left, right? So 
If you're good doing this graphically, you might not even have to write the equations of equilibrium. I'm going to do it because I want you all to be able to track the calculations as we go through this. So, like that's what we did first. But what's that going to, okay, now what do I do? And what's that going to give me? 15 doing what? Going down. So, and so then summing forces in the y direction. Let me ask a question. Do you want to draw a table on that or do you think you can eyeball that? Six up, right? Because the 15 and the 15 cancel each other out. So six down means you got to have six up. So, and that's member what? BH. Then over here, what we can do is we can say that this is six kips in what? This vertical member. So this is BH, six kips. Is it experiencing tension or compression? Compression. compression. All right, what's this one going to be? Compression. compression. And what's the number going to be? What's the magnitude going to be? 33.5. Same thing, right? Yeah. See? We're getting it knocked out, right? All right, we did this one. So we make a plan, we stick to it. And notice how the truss is, does it really seem that hard? I mean, you tell me, does it seem that difficult? Hopefully not, you know, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so joint B. Okay, so again, be systematic with it. Okay, the first thing, draw all the members that are going through joint B. Those are all the members that are framing through joint B, right? What about the slope ratio? What was the slope ratio of that diagonal member? That one's the one to one. Okay, so let's talk about that. This is the most difficult part of these types of trusses, is not the math. It's just this stuff like this, just the bookkeeping, okay? Just making sure that the bookkeeping works out, okay? So, all right. Are there any external loads applied at this joint? No, right? At this joint H, we had the six kips that was going down. Not here, there's nothing here, right? There's, so there's nothing. Are there any forces, however, that we know going into this? Any internal forces? Okay, so AB. So I'll write this. AB is 30 kips. Which way do I draw the arrow? To the left because it's in tension. So what about this vertical? Maybe what I'll do, hold on, let's do this. Let's say for this one, uh, this was joint H. Let's call this let's actually label that on that previous joint so we know where they're coming from. Okay. Okay. All right. Tell me what to do. Summing forces in the Y is going to give me what? There we go. So this. Do 
going up, right? So now what? Which going which way? Okay. So what's going on with member BC? Which way? That was pretty easy, wasn't it? See what I mean? Now I'm going to write the math over here just to sort of track the order that we did it. Because I mean, if you were following along, you know what order I did it in. Did it in bit. But um, looking over the calculations later might be kind of hard to follow which order I did it in. So let's, okay, so the first one we did was BI. So if BI is six going down, we gotta have six going up. And so since it's at a one-to-one -one slope ratio, we know that, that if BIY is six going up, then BIX is six kips going to the right. And so then when we do, when we sum forces in the X direction, we say we got 30 going to the left, six going to the right, we need another 24 going to the right. That's where that came from. No, no problem. Don't hesitate if you got questions like that. Okay. So, we know that this is 24 kips in what? Tension. What about this member? Is it tension or compression? Tension. Okay, and what, what's the magnitude on this diagonal member? Oh, hold on. This is diagonal. 8.49. How'd you get the 8.49? Pythagorean theorem. I got 6 squared plus 6 squared, so that's the square root of 72, which is 8.49. See? So, no, I mean, we have a truss that has 21 members, and we're just knocking it out. Just knocking it out. Okay, and I do want to keep the pace up because I want to show you what happens at the end, okay? Okay, joint I, right? Because that's the one that was next, right? We said A, then H, then B, then I. Funny how like as we're going into these joints, like we're not encountering these problems like, oh, we did the wrong joint because there's too many unknowns. Like we plan that out, you know? Make, I'm telling you, taking... A few seconds at the beginning of the problem to figure out which order you want to do the truss analysis in makes it go a lot faster. Okay. Now joint I, it's a little messy. There's a lot going on there. So let's let's uh, be diligent in writing this one out. So let's see. That's our joint, right? Because we've got this diagonal, that one, and that one. So because we got so many diagonals, let's do some bookkeeping on these slope ratios. Okay? What's this one? What's this one? What's that one? Okay. All right. Let's just make sure that we're good on that. Okay? All right. Are there any external loads at I? Six kips. Okay. Any internal forces that we know? Do we know this member right here? Yes. That's member HI, right? Mm -hmm. So we know HIX and HIY. Mm -hmm. What's that? Mm -hmm. That that one's BI or is that HI? Mm -hmm. This this one's BI right here. Which I think we know that one too, don't we? Mm -hmm. We just got that one. But, uh, so let's do that one. So BI is in tension or compression? Tension. That means the arrows go like this. Okay. And what are the magnitudes on BI, X, and BIY? Six. Six kips. So this one is... Okay. What about the, um, this one over here, HI? 
what is it? It's a compression, right? So that means the arrows go in, right? It means the arrows go like that. Like that. Okay? And that was what, 30 and 15? That's the hardest part. You know, just getting all the bookkeeping down. Okay? We don't know this member, and we don't know that one, right? So tell me what to do. Like, which one should I solve first? The X, right? So summing forces in the X direction. So, let's see. You want me to draw a table, or do you think you can eyeball this one? Did I forget something or did I get everything? Okay, so how many four horizontal forces do I have? That I know. Two. And this one's going to be the unknown, right? So what do I have? I've got 30 to the right, 6 to the left. So what is that? 24 to the left. Oh. And that's going to be what IJ alright so now what and that's going to give me what there we go I can do better than that Okay, now what about summing forces in the Y? Okay, so let's, let's take our time with this. All right, let's see. What do we have going down? Down we have 6, 6, and 12. So that's what, 24 going down? Going up we have 15. So what's that? 9. butchered that. And that's going to be member CI. Did I do that joint too fast? That joint was kind of messy. You tell me. Did I do that joint kind of messy? Okay. So when, I, when, when we were doing this one, this is the only one going up, okay. but the one that's going down is 6, 6, and 12, so that's 24. So 24 down and 15 up means we need another 9 going up. Yeah. Okay, which speaking of, let's put that over here on my log. So I've got 9 kips going up. Is this member of tension or compression? Compression. Then we've got this diagonal member, which that's 12 and 24. What is that? So 12 times the square root of 5, 25 something. Twenty-six point eight three. Intention or compression? Compression. We only have two joints left, don't we? Okay, so I want to knock these out kind of quickly because I really want you to see what happens on the last joint, okay? So let's go to C. C is a little bit easier. There's a little less going on. So C, we've got...
We've got that. What's the slope ratio on that member right there? 3, 2. Okay. Are there any external loads applied at C? No. Right? Okay. So what about any internal forces? Do I know any of these members? I know this one, right? This is 24 kips. Which way? Tension to the arrow goes to the left. So we'll call this BC. What about any other members? Do I know any others? The vertical one. And that's nine kips in compression. So which way do I draw the arrow? Down. So, yeah, I try and keep a consistent like color schemes. Like red is my known, blues are my unknown. So I don't know. I just came up with that a while back. Okay, so we've got that, that, that. Okay. Tell me what to do. Okay, summing forces in the Y means what? Okay, now what? Tells me what? Six kips, right? It's going to be the smaller component, three to two, and if three to two is the same thing as nine to six. And lastly, what's going on? with this member. This is member CD and what is it? 18, 18 to the right. right. Okay. Okay, I know we're running short on time, so I'll be quick with this. So, this CD is 18 kips in what? All right, and then this one, what is that? First off, it's tension, right? What's that? I need some help on that. 10.82. 10.82. Far so good. Last joint. Okay. Our last joint is joint D. Okay. That's the joint, right? Any external loads? Okay. Do I know this one? Okay, the only ones I don't know are this one and this one, right? Now, I told you that this one was also 18 kips, right? But you can also see that if I didn't tell you that, right? Because if I sum forces in the x direction, it's going to be that, right? That's going to be DE is 18 kips. But what's going on with this vertical member? Nothing, right? There are no vertical loads on this joint at all, right? So what is the force inside member DJ? Zero. And so... The way that we do that is on our truss is we usually just draw a big old zero like that. Okay? That's how we label that. And this, by the way, this is the answer. 
And what I will do is I will put this in the notebook. Since we're running out of time, I'll just copy this into the notebook at the very end. But does anybody have any questions on this? No. Okay. Yes. Hold on. All right. I'm going to pull up the code one more time in case anybody missed it. But that's all I have, everybody. I will, um, I will see you all on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend.